Closer Look. I'm Mark Schein with my good friend Mark Miller. And Mark, this is episode 10. We are at week 10 already in a closer look football at high school football. Has flown by. It has yeah. just jetted by. Has Well, we've got a lot to cover this afternoon, as we typically do. And you've got our first of our review games. There we go. Elida and Kenton, 51 to 50, over 100 points scored, 1,058 total yards. There were 82 passes. Elida jumped out to a 21-0 lead, but then Jaron Sharp got untracked. He ended up throwing for 394 yards and three touchdowns, rushed for over 104 more touchdowns, but Isaac McAdams tried to stay in step with him. 20 of 36, 230 in the air, three touchdowns. He also rushed for 153, had help from Daniel Unruh. 19 rushes, 133 yards, and a touchdown. You know, we talk a lot about one-point games, which this is, and a lot of times it's the kicking game, the PATs that lose the game. Noah Adcock, the kicker for Elida, had three field goals and six for six on PATs. They won by one point. Elida, seven and two, still in the playoff hunt. Mark, during the game, you called that an instant classic. That was a great high school football game. It was game. one of the funnest games I've ever done and, and even watched. It really it was. was. Fun. All right, there we go. Let's go to Minster and Versailles down in the MAC. Now, these teams not playing for a MAC championship, but trying to get into the playoffs. Versailles scores first on a Thompson four yard touchdown run, but then Minster goes on a roll and they score four touchdowns in a row. A couple of Hulesman touchdown passes, a Hulesman run, then a Schmeezing run. It's 26 7 Minster, but there comes Versailles. Thompson with a one-yard touchdown run. Noah Weimeyer throws a touchdown pass to Andrew Jemange. It's 26-21, but they can't get any closer to the Versailles Tigers. 392 yards of offense for Minster, 385 for Versailles. A lot of turnovers in the game. Minster turns it over four times for sales three. Minster probably in the playoffs. Versailles drops to three and six. Let's stay in the MAC. Coldwater 28, Anna 21. Anna led this game at halftime 14-0. In the third quarter, Coldwater sets up for a short field goal. Chip Otten says, no, no, we need touchdowns. Direct snap to the kicker, Caleb Dippold. He throws a two-yard pass to the quarterback, who was the holder, Sam Broering, and they get a touchdown, get on the board. They end up coming back and winning. Broering was 22 of 30 for 263 and a touchdown. Running back Ben Winning had three touchdowns. Aiden Ensley from Anna, what a running back he is. Also doing it on kickoff returns this week, a 90-yarder for a touchdown. Travis Meyer back from that injury, 217 yards passing. Both teams now are seven and two. That loss dropped Anna from number one to number six in Division Five. Isn't that amazing? How about that? Let's go to the NWC, a game of uh, featuring two one and four teams, Columbus Grove and Allen East, and back and forth they go. It's an every other possession game. Allen East scores first on a Tyler Clump touchdown pass. Then Blake Reynolds with a touchdown pass for Grove. Clump comes back and throws his second touchdown pass. Garrett Niemeyer goes in from 34 yards out for Grove. A Nichols run for Allen East, and they're up by a score, and then Columbus Grove gets the last two touchdowns of the game. With a minute 40 to go in the third quarter, Reynolds with a two-yard touchdown run, then he wraps it up with an, uh, eight minutes and 31 seconds to go in the game with a 55-yard touchdown pass to Owen first. The PAT was not good. That left the door open for Allen East. It's 27-21 Grove. It ended up that way. Reynolds was 12 of 20, 206. A couple of scores. He also rushed 13 times for 83 and a score. Niemeyer, 25 rushes, 155 and a score. And watch out for Columbus Grove next year. Just four seniors on that team, and they are going to be good. Yep, they'll be good. Well, it's time for stat stuffers. We got some new names this week. How about that? Well, let's start with a new one. Charles Stefanik from Crestview. Two kickoff returns for touchdowns, both of over 80 yards. That's five kickoff returns for touchdowns this year for Charles. 95-yard punt return in this game, but a penalty brought it back. Sean Bowling, the contributing editor on that one, for getting us that information. There you go. Seth Conley over to Ada. Ada beat Bluffton 42-17. Conley and his teammates had 558 yards of total offense. Conley himself, 24 of 37, 455 yards throwing the football, and five touchdown passes. Three of those touchdown passes went to Chase Sumner, who had 11 catches for 184. Now, here's an interesting stat, Mark. If you look at the official stat page for this game, Sumner's TD catches, 25, 67, and zero yards. <laughs> I think maybe we had a, a, maybe a misprint on that last oh, one, though. But he got a, a zero and something, 10, 20, whatever. Uh, he also had a couple of touchdown passes, did Conley to Aaron Everhart and Zach Sweeney. Ada goes to six and three, and they're on the fence for the playoffs right now. Let's look at a Salina duo. Brett Schwederman, the quarterback, 13 of 15. That's pretty good percentage. 340 yards, six touchdowns. 
rushed the ball 18 times for 141 touchdowns. Of those 13 completions and six touchdowns, his buddy Cole Merlin caught four of them. Cole also had a touchdown run. Shawnee had lost three games in a row. That was going to OG Kenton and Elida. Then they go to Bath and they put 56 on the board. In fact, they put 28 on the board in the first quarter. Johnny Capella, 11 of 18, throwing the football 333 yards, two throw scores through the air. He then rushed seven times for 101. 88 of those yards came on a touchdown run. He also had two other one-yard runs. Shawnee goes to three and five, and they will have Salina at home this week. Well, it's the weekly Will Holman watch, and another average game for Will. <laughs> 22 carries, 291 yards, and three touchdowns. He does it every week, carries the ball, Never leaves the field. What a durable back Will Homan is. And Van Buren's Jacob Leal. Now, he, they, Van Buren defeated Riverdale 34-19. He carried the ball eight times. 164 <laughs> yards. That's better than a 20-yard average. Three scores. His scores were from 40, 44, and 44. We like those 44 numbers around here, guess, don't we? Yeah. And he also caught a couple of balls for 26 yards. Van Buren's five and four and they go to Arcadia this week. And you did some work on our fun football fact of the week involving okay. the Heisman. Well, let's talk about the Heisman Trophy. And everybody's going to think, we're going to ask, who is the only multiple winner of the Heisman Trophy? And all of us Ohio mm -hmm. State fans yes. know it's Archie, Archie Griffin. Right. I think 73, 74, something like that. No, it wasn't that that we're going to ask. We're going to ask, who is the first Heisman Trophy winner of all time? His name was Jay Burwanger. He went to the University of Chicago back when they were a power, the same time that the Ivies were a power in the nation, and it was in 1935. There you see, Jay. Now, it wasn't called the Heisman Trophy the first few years. It was called the Downtown Athletic Club Trophy, and it turned into the Heisman, and there is Jay Burwanger, the very first Heisman Trophy winner. Back when we didn't always give it to a quarterback? Um, probably not. Probably not. Okay, well, you've also <laughs> done some work for us this week. There's Archie's picture right there, the two-time yeah, Heisman two winner. two-timer, yeah. Yep, how about that? Yeah. You did some work for us this week. You and I have Minster and Anna this week, and you went yeah. looking for some stuff on some there alumni from Minster. Let's look at Brian Wolf. Now, Brian was a football and baseball star at Minster. In 1989, he was on the Division V State Football Championship team. He was a two-time All-Mac running back at 6'5", 220 pounds. <laughs> Can you imagine one. trying to tackle that? Yeah. He was also All-State in 1991. But baseball, as a pitcher and outfielder for Minster, he was a three-time All-Mac player. He batted 489 his senior year and drafted in the 13th round by the Pittsburgh Pirates. He played in 92 and 93 for the Gulf Coast Pirates. Played a little outfield, played a little first base. Now, you might recognize that name from Minster, Wolf. His nephews are Ethan and Eli. They were the great players at Minster when they won a state championship, and now they are both at the University of Tennessee. Ethan is a starter. Eli gets to play. They're both tight ends. Brian graduated from the University of Miami in architecture. He now is an architect with Garmin Miller in Minster for 17 years, and our two schools, Bath right. and Elida, yep. he built both those new schools, so he did a great yep. job there. Wife Shelley and children, a very, I hope I pronounced that right, 16 years old, Brady 12 and Ansley 6. Brian is a big guy still today, and I can see how he was a great athlete yeah. in high school and college and pro baseball. And how about his nephews, what they're doing out at oh, the University of Tennessee? Doing a good job, yeah. Well, from our bright spot this week, we're going to start out with a picture you found that was really, really cool. Oh, man. You know, St. Mary's Salina is such a rivalry, and, and the guys lay it on the field, and then they do something like this afterwards that really let you know what's important. Look at all the fans. Nobody left. They're watching the kids on the field. This is prayer after the Salina St. Mary's game, Battle of Lake St. Mary's, and uh, they had different players step up and lead it. There you see a, a senior tight end. I'm drawing a blank on his name right now from St. Mary's leading the prayer. And uh, good job, fellas. Good job, coaches. And good job, uh, I think Steve Stroh and Mike Reams had something to do with that down there. Yep. Good job, guys. Well, we got two good pieces of good news. First of all, the clock that warns us every week on how much time we have left died, so we don't have to worry about how much time we have left. <laughs> and second, you okay. find out some interesting facts about participation in Ohio football. Hey, football in Ohio, just out, just a couple years old, but it takes a while to get it in. There are 724 schools that play football in Ohio. Another 700 junior highs, that means 78,000 students play football, and over 1.3 million fans watch each week. How does that compare nationally? Over 1.1 million students playing, including 2,140 girls. How about that? That surprised me. That is. That's All right, just so some facts about how popular okay. football is in Ohio. 
Well, the clock's back. Anyway, oh. our question mark of this week, has a game ever been canceled due to weather? Well, right away, this fall, we learned in a hurry, right. hurricanes can cancel games. Right. Texas, Florida, down in the Gulf Coast, a lot of cancellations. So the answer is yes. Um, a lot of delays. We see lightning here. We, we've done games that they'll delay on Friday, finish on Saturday. A few years ago, LCC and Elida started on Friday, continued on Saturday, <laughs> finished on, on Sunday. Sunday yeah. So we see that. But the question is, has fog ever canceled right. a game? We don't know that it's ever canceled a game, but there have been some real foggy games. Let's look at one just recently. This is in New England the other night. They're playing the uh, Atlanta Falcons, I believe, and the fog set in. Although we're going to see on the bottom there, pretty soon you're going to flip to the Fog Bowl, 1988. This is at Soldier Field in Chicago. The Eagles are playing there. This was the foggiest game pictures I've ever right. seen. They said that the announcer up in the press box could not see. So the, uh, the referee on the field turned his mic on and he would give down and distance and where the ball was on the field. That's the only way the people in the press box knew where the ball was. There's Randall Cunningham, Mike Singletary with a big hit, some very famous players. Mike Ditka was a coach of the Bears back in those days, just a few years after they won the Super Bowl. And then one game that you're very That's familiar right. with, just a couple of years ago down at Northmont High School, Coldwater and West Jefferson in a playoff game. Yeah, this game, uh, not nearly the fog of that particular level, but there was a lot of fog this night. When you're up in the press box high above the field, it was difficult to see, and it was an interesting game to call. We were able to see the players enough to call it, but certainly a very difficult situation. There it doesn't look so bad, but the actual fog game and trying to do the game was, was a pretty difficult scenario. I was in Bellevue one time. We were on the chain gang. We had this roll in off of Lake Erie, and what would happen was they gave a, a PA to one of the, uh, the guy coaches on the sideline. He would tell the PA announcer what happened. So if somebody would run a play, the players were back in the huddle, and all of a sudden you hear, hey, somebody ran for five yards in the first hour. Everybody would cheer 30 seconds after it happened. So it was kind of a cool thing to go through and, and to watch that. But uh, an interesting situation with uh, weather and those particular things. All right. Well, let's get to our preview games. We're going to start with Macomb and Liberty Benton. And doesn't it seem like every year they play for the, the BBC yes, Championship? Week All right. 10. Great way to finish. Macomb 7-0, Liberty Benton 6-1. and one. The computer says they're both going to make the playoffs. How about balance? Each of them has scored 382 points this year. Liberty Benton has given up 95, Macomb 118. How about last week, Macomb? Their quarterback, Cam Morris, is out, so they make a wide receiver into their quarterback. Now, he only completed one of his three passes, did Tanner Schrader, but it was for a 58-yard touchdown pass. We know that uh, they like to run the football, does Macomb. They're number one in the conference in rushing. Austin May, the quarterback for Liberty Benton, completed 63% of his passes, 18 touchdowns. Liberty Benton extremely well balanced, 1,639 yards on the ground. 1,539 through the air. Once again, Macomb and Liberty Benton for the league championship in the BBC. Let's look at the WBL. St. Mary's at 8-1, 8-0. They are the WBL champs. Going to go to Wapak. Playoff bubble for Wapak. They're at number seven right now. We're going to call it the Doug Fry Bowl because he coached at St. Mary's and he coached at Wapak. Now he's back at St. Mary's, so this game means a lot to both teams. St. Mary's beat Defiance 50 to nothing, averaging 40 a game. Of course, that running attack is weatherproof, as the weather might be a factor. Wapak, they beat OG 35-10. They have the best defense in the WBL, so they will be tested. Running backs Keck, Gibson, Apple, Miller, they do it by committee. Also a little bit of weatherproofing there, as this will be a run game versus run game. Into the NWCC, and this time it's Lehman and Riverside playing for the league championships. It's like we say that every year as well. The computer says they're both going to make the playoffs, so this is partly for league championship and partly for where they're going to stack up in the playoffs. Lehman comes in averaging 40 yard, uh, points per game. Riverside gives up just 15. That's kind of an interesting thing. Lehman has won a championship last year when they tied with USV. Riverside tied with Fort Laramie before that. Here's the interesting stat out of all this. Lehman Catholic has been in the conference for five years. They have, Riverside has not defeated them during that five-year time period. Of course, Perry hopes that Riverside wins because if that happens and Perry can defeat Marion Elgin, there'll be a three-way tie at the top and Perry would have their first league championship. And with that, Mark, let's move on to our playoffs. And we got kind of, Garrett put some slides together here for us and we can kind of look at where the 32 teams, I think I counted in our area and where they're at right now. And we'll kind of scroll down through this. These are the teams who the computer says are in with some notes on the sidelines about uh, home and first seating and those types of things. The other teams still have a chance to move into number one seeds or into uh, home games. And you can see those uh, six schools right there. 
Just a couple of teams already know that they're the number one seed. Everybody else still playing for seeding. So these uh, week 10 games are important. All right, here's, the, here's another batch. Here's a batch as well. I think there were 17 teams in the, the Salina Elida bracket that are still eligible with a week to go. And here's some teams that need some help to get in. And one more slide to put up with you. And there's Perry. Boy, they would sure like to get in. Perry has never been in the playoffs and some teams like that. Let's put our broadcast schedule up. And we got a note about Anna coming up. We put the broadcast schedule up. You and I will be uh, Minster at Anna. That's a Friday night game we'll see on Saturday. And good news for us. We get a rocket dog. We get a rocket dog. Yeah, we're going to go Anna. down there looking for Dave Bell, our buddy. We're going to have a rocket dog with Dave. And once again, the clock died. So if we're late, we don't care. But you've been watching a closer look on WOSN. <laughs>